Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this will be part three in my study titled Refuting Paul Onlyism, Defending Jesus, John, and Peter. Now, if you haven't seen the first two parts of this, it'll make a lot more sense if you go back and watch it from the beginning. But the first thing I want to say is that those people who believe in Paul onlyism that uh, uh, Paul is the only apostle to the Gentiles, he's our apostles and all the others should be pretty much ignored. Uh, and we can only receive salvation through Paul's writings. You can't receive salvation through the gospel of John or the, the words of Jesus. If, if that's what you believe, uh, then you're a Paul onlyist. But Paul onlyists uh, are Christians. They're saints, they're saved. They're just as saved as I am. But they're sadly very misled and mistaken about uh, how they're interpreting the scriptures. So go back and start from the beginning and you'll, I think this will make a lot more sense to you. But that's the first thing I want to know. This is not uh, uh, an attempt to classify them as, uh, you know, lost people. Uh, however, this the way that they're, quote, rightly dividing the word of God uh, is really wrongly dividing it. It's over dividing it. And it's because of that, they're, uh, they're coming to some very bad conclusions. But they are saved because they do believe, uh, as I do, that salvation is a free gift. Uh, we receive by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But they make a mistake of adding from Paul alone. They believe that we can only receive the salvation through Paul's writings. So that's the, uh, the foundation of the problem, but uh, I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, last time. And first thing I want to tell you is that I did receive a comment from a YouTuber and his channel is called First Corinthians 15, one through four. And he made a comment uh, on Brother Bill's um, community, his uh, called uh, the uh, Grace Gospel of Grace, I believe. The Great uh, Grace Community. I forgot the name of it, but he, um, Brother Bill, Pan, the Panda Man Evangelist, uh, started this community, and I'm posting comments and videos on it. And so this user, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, this is the comment that he made, agreeing with my premise that uh, the idea that uh, the message Paul preached uh, was not different than what was taught by the other apostles and Jesus. It was not a unique message, a unique gospel. Now, so he says, the Apostle Paul taught the very same gospel as the Old Testament prophets and Moses did. Paul tells us this in his own words. And the verses he gave me was Acts 25, verses 22 and 23. It says, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So that's the first thing we need to understand is that Paul was declaring that everything he was saying had already been previously declared by the prophets. It was, it was not a new message. He was just proclaiming that the prophets have, uh, prophecies have been fulfilled. And as verse 23 says that Christ, 
let me say, go back to this, saying none of the things and those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So this is uh, telling us that uh, uh, Paul is declaring and admitting that his gospel, his message was not you new and it was not unique. He's saying it, he's not saying anything different than the prophets and Moses said that Christ would suffer, that he would be the rise from the dead and he would be, uh, the salvation would be offered to the Gentiles. So uh, thank you. First Corinthians 15, one through four, the YouTuber uh, for sending me that. That's a, those are verses that I had not put into my study, but I'm glad to have them. Now let's move on to Acts 17. And I'm starting with verse one. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Ap Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where a synagogue of the Jews, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days, reason, reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. All right, so this is Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to go over this more carefully. I hope you'll go to this and look at it and really, really meditate on this if you are a Paul onlyist. Because Paul is saying, it says right here, and Paul, as his manner was, so this is, in other words, his manner, this is what he normally did. He would normally uh, go into a town and find the synagogue where the Jews were. So, you see, we, we, you, you say that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but he continued going to every town and first talking to the Jews, going to the synagogue. And it says what he did there was he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Now, what were the scriptures? Well, they didn't. They didn't have this. <laughs> this was not published. They had scrolls. They had writings from what's called the Law and the Prophets. This is the Old Testament writings, and um, they were in every synagogue. Copies of them, and he would go through these Old Testament scriptures. Uh, and he would show from the Old Testament scriptures all the things about Jesus that had happened. And he said, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So this is already written down in the Old Testament, uh, opening the scriptures and alleging, that means claiming, that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. So he was saying, look, the prophets in the Old Testament told us what was going to happen, that Christ would come, he'd suffer, he'd die for our sins, and he would be raised from the dead, and that's all in the scriptures. I'm going to go over this more thoroughly later, but... Uh, in, uh, if you read Isaiah chapter 53 or tw uh, Psalm number 22, it's cl clearly expelled out exactly what happened to Jesus. So I'm sure pa Paul went through those scriptures and others and showed them that, look, this is what the prophets have said would happen, that God would provide Christ, a Savior, and he would die and he would raise from the dead and this would be atonement for our sins. So it's important you understand that uh, this was not a new revelation. This was 
revealed all through the Old Testament. If you want to see this really show, uh, showed more clearly, uh, I have an exhaustive study that I did called The Bloody Trail. And in The Bloody Trail, I go through from Genesis all the way through the scriptures showing all the things that happened throughout history that talked about the Messiah that would come and die for our sins and the sacrifices and, and what it all meant. So the, the Old Testament is just packed with the theology of God would provide a savior. He'd die for our sins and he'd be raised from the dead. Um, and so Paul's saying that all these things that I'm reading to you from the, the scriptures, it was fulfilled. This Christ is actually Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is Christ. So now let's look at Acts 28, verse 23. He witnessed to them, still this is talking about Paul. Paul witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God. And from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. So again, Acts, 20, Acts chapter 17, Acts 28, they both say the same thing, that he would go into these synagogues, he'd be talking to the Jews, he'd pull out the scriptures, the law of Moses and all the prophets' writings, and he'd persuade them that all these things that were prophesied have been fulfilled through Jesus. So it was not a new message. It was just saying everything that the prophets told, prophets told us would happen has happened, and Jesus is the Christ. Now let's go to uh, look at uh, 2 Timothy uh, 3, verse 14 uh, and 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Second Timothy. This is a letter Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy was Paul's protege. He, he uh, was teaching him how to become a pastor. And he, uh, he, was, uh, he wrote first and second Timothy to him all talk. And these are called the pastoral epistles. And Paul is telling Timothy how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures. Now, again, all these New Testament books that we, we're familiar with were not written at this point. When Paul talks about going through the Scriptures, through the Law and the Prophets, uh, he's talking about the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, this is what is we find in the Old Testament. Paul says, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, from infancy, you have known the Old Testament, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying here that in the Old Testament, the scriptures tell us enough to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So if you think that you can only be saved by Paul's writings, uh, Paul is actually saying here that, no, you can get saved from reading the Old Testament because the Old Testament tells us all about the Savior, Jesus. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. Paul writing, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures now i know paul only is that believe that this is the most important part of the entire bible first corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 uh, and it is an important but it is not the only part of the scriptures that a person can read and get saved paul declares it right here if you really look at what he's saying in these two verses he says 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What's he talking about? He's not talking about the letters he's he's written. He's not talking about uh, the Gospel of John or anything else. And none of this stuff was even written at this point. This is First Corinthians, uh, chapter fifteen, verse one through four, and he's talking about the Old Testament, the Law, and the Prophets. He's just like he was discussed in these other two points in Second Timothy, Acts twenty-eight, and Acts seventeen. He's referencing according to the scriptures. That's the Old Testament. He says in the Old Testament scriptures, it tells us how Christ would die for our sins and that he would be buried and that he would be raised from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. So over and over and over and over again, Paul uses the Old Testament to teach about Jesus his death, burial, and resurrection, and his death for our sins. So it, to think that uh, this message of our salvation is exclusive to Paul's writings, and some of you, some of you paul onlyists are so extreme that you even reduce it down not only not all of Paul's writings, uh, but the, only this particular chapter and these four verses. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Some of you are saying you can't get saved without those verses. But Paul is saying, no, you can learn the same thing all through the scriptures, all through the Old Testament. Now let's look at Galatians 3.21. The law then against the prom uh, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So again, Paul is referencing the scripture. He said, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. When Paul uses the word scripture, he's referring to the Old Testament writings. So he's saying in the Old Testament, we learn that we're all under sin and that by the, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ, might be given to them that believe. So again, he's saying here that the law was never a means for salvation. Uh, it, it was always impossible. He says, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So he's, he's talking about how the law, the law was never intended to um, be part of the salvation formula that you believe in God and you and you follow the laws you go to heaven you no know, following the law was never part of it I discussed that in previous uh, part one or part two of this study but he goes on to say verse 23 but before faith came we were kept under the law, shut up into the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. So Paul is saying, uh, as we found earlier from that, um, you know, the Old Testament also declared the law was not intended to be something that uh, was a method or a means or a formula for, for salvation. It was only intended to show us our sinfulness and so that we would be humble and say, I need a savior. I need to be saved. I can't do it. So Paul calls it a schoolmaster. Schoolmaster is a teacher. So the law is supposed to be the, a teacher. What does it teach us? It teaches us our sinfulness 
and our need for forgiveness and salvation. So now let's go to Acts 16, 30 and 31. Uh, he that he then brought them out and asked, this is a, the Philippian jailer. Um, Paul and Silas were in jail and uh, the Philippian jailer asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Or in King James, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. So Paul is teaching, uh, answering the question, what must I do? What is the requirement for salvation? That's what the Philippian jailer wants to know. He knew that Paul and Silas were in jail and you know they had uh, been singing hymns and they've been talking about Jesus and he, he knew that they were uh, that's why they were in jail and he wanted to know well what is it what is it that's required I want to be saved what do I have to do Paul said simply believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved now you notice that Paul did not say uh, believe on Jesus and get baptized and get communion and get all your sacrifices and light your candles and follow the Ten Commandments and uh, uh, on and on and on. Didn't have a list of things that he was requiring the Philippian jailer to do. If, if all these other things or if any other things were actually part of salvation, if they were part of this requirement, this part of the answer, what must I do to be saved? If anything more than believing on Jesus was required, then Paul didn't answer the question correctly. If any more was required than faith in Jesus, then Paul was either dishonest or ignorant and didn't know what was required or was negligent, didn't bother to tell him everything he needed to know. But I don't believe that's the case. I believe Paul knew what was required. I believe he was honest and told him the truth. And I believe he told him everything he needed to know. Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. This is called easy believism. Some people use it as a, a slander, a, a derogatory term, but I, as I made a video titled Easy Believism, and I, I embrace the term. I wear it as a badge of honor because that's what biblical Christianity really is. It's easy to be saved because Jesus did the hard part. He did everything that's required. We just need to believe in him for our salvation and not believe in ourselves. Uh, then again, we see in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So, he says, for by grace are ye saved, through faith. Grace is God's part. There's a channel on, that I recommend on YouTube called Grace Faith 08. And the pastor explains that the reason they named their church Grace Faith is because grace is God's part. God contributes grace. He, grace means if I'm gracious, that I'm, I'm just kind to you without any, any cause, for no good reason. You, you, just, you don't deserve it. You haven't done anything to deserve my kindness, but I am just being gracious to you and being kind and merciful and forgiving because I'm gracious. Well, this is talking about God in this case. It says, by grace, because of the grace of God, you're saved through faith. So saved means... That's talking about salvation, eternal life. And you get it through faith. Now, faith is man's part. We put our faith in Jesus. Jesus' part is he's gracious. He gives us salvation as a free gift because we believed in him. Now, the subject of this verse here is salvation. Some people twist this around and they try to make this subject faith 
And that leads us to the next part. And it says, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, what is the gift of God? The gift of God is salvation. Uh, for example, it says, um, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, the scriptures do not teach us that faith is a gift. Scriptures teach us salvation is a gift. So uh, it, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. That means that the, uh, the salvation is not based on you. It's not based upon anything about you. You don't have any good quality that merits this salvation. It's only because God is gracious. If you believe in Jesus, God is gracious and he gives you this salvation. And it says, it is the gift of God, a gift. Obviously, gift is something that's given. And when you give something to someone, you don't charge them for it. It's a gift. You don't have, they don't have to work for it or earn it or pay for it. They don't have to work for it because Jesus did the work. He lived a sinless, perfect life. We couldn't do it, but he did that, and we get credit for his perfect life. Uh, we don't, you don't have to pay for it. Jesus paid for it. With his suffering and his death and his blood, he paid for our salvation. Um, so we, we don't have to work. We can't work for it. It's impossible. We, we can't uh, earn it. Uh, can't pay for it. If we try to do that on our own, we'd all fail. That's why we need to be saved. So it says, uh, not of works. It's the gift of God, not of works. So if, if you're someone who believes that uh, you, Christianity is based on believing in Jesus and doing good works, it says right here, it's not of works lest any man should boast. And that's what you have to do. If, if, if you think that your works have anything to do with getting saved or staying saved or even proving that someone is saved based upon their works, how, how good their life is, then you're sadly mistaken. Because if you think it's based on your works, then you're boasting. Because obviously you, you think that your works are good enough and God's satisfied with it. So you're boasting. If you say you're saved and it's based on works, then that's a form of boasting. And it says, no, you're not supposed to be able to boast. You cannot boast about anything because you've not done nothing. You're not saved because of personal merit. It's all based upon God's grace and Jesus's works, what he did. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath or hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And verse 10 is a beautiful verse. It tells us that it puts everything in perspective. We're not saved uh, because we do good works. We don't stay saved if we, if we start doing good works. Uh, but works play a part in a, in a Christian's life. And that is that it says we are his workmanship. So once we're saved, God works in our lives and he is cre transforming us, creating, created in Christ Jesus for good works, unto good works. So Christians, it says here, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So Christians should do good works, uh, but Christians are not uh, identical. We're, we're all unique. Some Christians do a lot of good works. Some do a little good works. Some do no good works. Some some do some do works. Let's talk about. Let's 
pre-classified, say they grow and mature in their faith. Uh, and some people grow quickly and, and get mature. Some people grow more slowly over a lifetime. Some people don't grow much at all, if, if at all. We're all unique. But we should, we should grow and we should be productive Christians. But that's not what determines if we're Christians. And that just tells us that, you know, how much have you grown since you got saved? Grown spiritually. Now let's look at Romans 3.27 and 28. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So again, in Ephesians and in Romans, Paul's talking about boasting. He, he wants you to know that if you're really a Christian, you have no right to boast because you can't take any credit for your salvation because it's, it's not based upon you changing your life and you living a good life and you being religious. That It's not based on that. It's based upon the works of Christ, what he's already done for us. He lived a sinless, perfect life. His righteousness is imputed to us when we put our faith in him. Uh, the sins that we've done in the past and the sins that we may do in the future, all that was charged to Jesus Christ on the cross. So Jesus lived a perfect life. We get credit for that. Jesus paid for our sins. We get credit for that. He's already paid the penalty. We don't have to pay it. So uh, he, Paul is saying here that you have no right to boast. But if, if you were basing your salvation on your personal merit in any way, then you would have the right to boast. And Paul's saying right here in Ephesians and in Romans, he says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. He says, by what law of works? Nay, but the law of faith. Because the law we're under is faith. You must have faith. That's what's required. You must have faith in Jesus for your salvation. That's the law. And uh, because of that, uh, you know, boasting is excluded because you can't, you can't boast uh, because Jesus you can only boast in Jesus and say, Jesus is great. All the glory, all the credit goes to Jesus. And then he finishes up here, one of my favorite verses, Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, when we say justified by faith without the deeds of the law, that means faith alone. Faith with no law. Faith with no works, faith alone. So if you're looking for a verse that says we're saved by faith alone, look at Romans 3.28. Now, let's go to Romans 4, chapter 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Uh, so, so in other words, if, if someone is um, you have a job. If I'm your employer and you work for me and you work your eight-hour shift, you work your full week, and, and you come to me, uh, I, can't, I cannot pay you and say this is a reward. It's a gift. You can say, well, what are you talking about? I worked for that. I earned it. It's You owe me. It's a debt. So Paul is saying, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. It's not grace if, if it's based on works, but of debt. So if, if you think that your works have anything to do with your salvation, then you're saying because of your work, God is in your debt. God owes you. So Paul says in verse 5, but to him that worketh not. Now, first of all, to work worketh not, that means zero work. A person who's never done one good thing in their life. All they've ever done is bad, 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 sin, 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 from beginning to end. They 
it says to him that worketh not it doesn't say to him that worked less than someone else it says this, this person he's giving an example to a person that's never done any work at all so he has no merit at all there's nothing he can claim look what i did god it says to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justify the ungodly well the one that justifies the ungodly is jesus so if you do no works but you believe on jesus your faith is counted for righteousness your faith in jesus makes you righteous to god even though you did zero work so the point i want to make i could go on and on and on and on there's dozens and dozens of verses that i could quote that paul said that make the same case but the, the point i want to make the conclusion here is what did paul teach paul taught easy believism he taught that all that was required was believing he taught that don't add any other requirements otherwise you could boast about it that the boasting is prohibited it's it's uh excluded so uh, paul taught all you got to do is believe on Jesus. Uh, no works are required. And then he also said, what about the law? Well, what is the point of the law? The law was our schoolmaster. If you try to follow the law, it'll you know, eventually come to the conclusion that it's impossible and you're lost and you need to be saved. So the whole point of the law was just to make us understand our hopeless situation and cry out to God, God, I need to be saved. And the only way to be saved is putting your faith in the one who justified the ungodly, Jesus Christ. So this is what Paul taught. And what I'm trying to do now is I want to compare what Paul taught with others. Now, everybody agrees that we get saved based on what Paul said, what Paul taught. I agree with that. But now let's compare it and see what did Jesus teach. Was it different than Paul? Okay, uh, let's look at uh, Mark chapter 10, and this is also in Luke chapter 18. Uh, and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So this person was asking Jesus, I want to have eternal life. I... It, if I do something good, can I have eternal life? This is the philosophy of the whole world. It's always been the philosophy of the world, thinking that somehow I can get do something good and please God and he'll let me have eternal life. But that's, that's a heresy. All the religions of the world are based on that. And that's the, the most common belief system throughout history and even today. And this man is asking Jesus, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he saith unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So the first thing, interesting thing here is Jesus is not answering his question directly. He first he's trying to ask him, Well, when, do you realize when you call me good that you're calling me God? Jesus did not say, don't call me good, because that would means that if you call me good, then I'm God. He didn't say, don't call me good. He's saying, do you realize that when you call me good, you're equating me with God? And uh, because only God is good. Now, people are relatively good. Uh, there's a this good person test. It's a, are you good enough to go to heaven? And and you, you quiz someone and 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 ask them, you know, uh, have you done this wrong or that wrong? And they try to determine if they're good enough to go to heaven. And and you say, well, well, I think I'm a pretty good person. But that's because you're comparing yourself to other people. 
We can always find people who are worse than us, and then we, we think we're good. We all puffed up, and we, we boast that we're a pretty good person. But Jesus is saying this concept of good doesn't mean good. It means perfect. It, it, let's take one of the O's out of the word good, and you have God. Perfection. So that's the point Jesus is making first with this uh, man. He says, uh, only God is good. Only God is perfect. Uh, now, he says, but uh, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So in other words, if, you, if you're able to follow all the commandments, okay, you can have eternal life if you can follow it all perfectly. And uh, we know that if a person could, from the, their birth to their death, uh, live a sinless, perfect life, never have a, a bad thought or never uh, have a sin that they've committed or never have a sin of omission, the things they should have done and neglected to do, they grew through their whole life like that, then they'd be perfect. But the Bible says that no one is righteous, not even one of us. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus is saying, yeah, if, if you want to get through to heaven through good works, then just follow all the commandments. And then the man says to him, he saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, if a person is going to be honest, they're going to understand that uh, they they haven't been able to do all these things completely. If if nothing else, the very last one, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If a person's going to really reflect on themselves and be honest and evaluate their lives, but the young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? So the first thing we need to understand is that. The question Jesus asked the young man, why callest thou me good, went right over the, the man's head. He didn't even respond to that. He tuned it out for some reason, because then he could have said, oh, do you really think I'm good? Do you really think I'm God? Because I am. I've been claiming to be God. Have you been following me around listening to what I'm saying? That's why they want to stone me. That's why they want to kill me. That's why they're going to arrest me, because I'm claiming to be God. But the, this rich young, young ruler, he didn't even realize the point of that question. Instead, he wanted to prove how good he was and see if, should I say, look, I'm good. I follow all these commandments from my youth. So what else do I have to do then, Jesus? And he, uh, Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, you see, Jesus is saying that it, you've got to be perfect to go to heaven on personal merit. He said, go and sell that thou hast and give it to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. So the G, Jesus wanted to tell, make him to understand that, okay, you think you're following these laws. I know you're not really following them completely. Uh, because Jesus said, even if you have lustful thoughts, you've committed adultery in your heart. If, if you've hated someone, you've committed murder in your heart. The, the people don't realize how strict the law is, and you have to be perfect. So he says to you, dear rich young man, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come and follow me. And of course, Jesus knew the man was not willing to do that because he was rich and he, and he loved his position. And it, he said, the answer was, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So did he love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength? Did he have other gods? Was, was money and materialism and possessions his, uh, uh, a God to him? That's the point Jesus wanted to prove to him. Jesus wanted to convict him. 
make him understand you're not as good as you think you are. You need to be saved. And the man went away very sad because he had great possessions. And then in verse 23, then said Jesus unto his disciples, verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter in the kingdom of, God, of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You see, here I talked about this earlier. These are interchangeable terms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. King, they're both spiritual kingdoms. They're, they're, there's not a physical kingdom. They want, they want you to believe the Paulius that the, the kingdom of heaven is some physical kingdom. It's the millennial kingdom where Jesus is going to be leader of, of king of the Jews. But he's referring to kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is the same thing. And it's a spiritual kingdom. So when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed saying, who then can be saved? What an important question. One of the most important questions ever asked, I think. Uh, so Jesus is saying it's, it's almost impossible. He said, a rich man can hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because rich people, they, their focus, their, their God becomes money. In order to become rich, everything in their life has to be dedicated towards that. And they, they're not thinking about God. They're thinking about them acquiring more wealth. Normally, there's exceptions. He says, a rich man can hardly enter the kingdom of God. Uh, so the apostles are shocked by this because they thought in Judaism, they thought that uh, when people are rich and God was blessing them because, because they were good, because they did good works, they got blessed. And, and uh, they, as they got more wealthy, that was evidence that they were really good. And they said, well, then, if it's so hard for a rich person to get into heaven, who then can be saved? Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This uh, is one of the most important verses in the scriptures. That if people could understand this verse, it would clear up a lot of problems. See, someone asked me, uh, or made the point to me recently, about Paul Onius. Uh, this person was, was being drawn into it. And it was really attractive to him. And from watching my teachings, you know, he's seen the light now, and he sees how the problem with the air of it, but he says it's very tantalizing because uh, it it solves a lot of problems. It solves a lot of problems like uh, the the words of Jesus and some of the other writings and the gospel accounts that that uh, are hard to understand because people think that uh, misunderstand them and they say that see it shows you that it's a different message. It's not faith alone. There's works required. You've got to sell everything you own, see? And you give it to the poor to be saved. But Jesus wasn't, wasn't saying that in order for a person to be saved. He's trying to convict the man and make him understand. No, you have to be perfect. Jesus is trying to make us all understand that we all fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God standard is set by Jesus and that's perfection. None of us can reach it. So this is what I call the impossible sayings of Jesus. Right here, he actually uses the word impossible. He said, they say, who then can be saved? And Jesus behold them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. So in other words, if you're trying to get saved, through your own efforts, on your own, as a man, as a person. And if you're trying to get saved based upon yourself, by believing in yourself, by believing in your own ability, it's impossible. And Jesus continually 
tried to prove that point. Go, be perfect, because my Father in heaven is perfect. You know, gouge out your eye if it makes you sin. Cut off your hand if it makes you sin. All these impossible sayings to try to drive home the point that you cannot follow the law perfectly. It's impossible. The law is there, as Paul said, as a schoolmaster to teach us our need for salvation. Paul called it a schoolmaster. Jesus called it impossible. But he said, but with God, all things are possible. So Jesus is telling us here in this one verse, on your own, it's impossible. You can't follow the commandments. You're going to fall short. You can't meet the standard of perfection. But with God, it is possible. You can be saved with, by putting your faith in God. And he reveals that he is God. He is the Savior that you need to put your faith in. With Jesus, salvation is possible. With Jesus, you, you're promised salvation. So here we have Jesus and Paul uh, uh, use the law to bring us to Christ. Um, so in Galatians 3.24 again, Paul says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And with Jesus, he said, the law was impossible. And that's why you need to put your faith in God, put your faith in the Savior. So G Jesus uh, and Paul are saying identical things. It's impossible to get saved through the law. That's the first thing we need to understand. Jesus is not teaching you must follow the law to be saved. He's saying, go ahead and try it. But it's impossible. Same thing Paul said. Now, uh, so um, when let's when, G, when how about a direct question? When when uh, Paul was asked directly how to be saved, I covered this before Acts sixteen thirty thirty one. Uh, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Paul answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. Yeah, that's what it. Paul's asked the direct question. What must I do to be saved? Paul answers, believe in Jesus and you will be saved. Now, let's look at Jesus in the in exactly the same circumstances. John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? So, again, these Jews, just like the rich young ruler, asking the same kind of question, what works do I have to do? What do I have to do to have the... Inherit eternal life. What they ask, what works do we have to do to do the works of God so God's satisfied with us? So Jesus has asked the same direct question Paul's asked. What works, what do I have to do? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now we know. The one that God sent is his son, Jesus. So Jesus is telling these people, and the direct answer to their question is, you want to know what you got to do? Believe on me. Paul asked the question, what do I have to do to be saved? He says, believe on Jesus. Their answer to this direct question, what do I have to do to be saved, is the same answer, believe. Now let's look at John eleven twenty one. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if, that, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Uh, of course, this is Mary and Martha, their sisters. The brother was Lazarus. Uh, Jesus loved them very much. They, they loved Jesus. They had a great friendship and love for each other. And Martha is saying, you, Jesus delayed in coming when they said that, when he heard that Lazarus was sick. And Jesus knew he was going to die, but he delayed it. And then Martha is saying, if you'd only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now I know that God will do whatever you ask. And then Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. 
Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So Jesus is saying, your brother shall rise again. And Jesus is talking about, in his mind, he's going to raise him right then. But Martha's immediate reaction was, well, of course he's going to rise at the last day at the resurrection. We'll all be resurrected because she was uh, a part of the, uh, her belief system was believing in the resurrection. Whereas there were some Jews who didn't believe in the resurrection. Um, so, but Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. So she's deciding that the last day there's going to be this resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So he's telling her that this resurrection, the last day that you're looking forward to, that's all based on me. You, you believe in me and you will have resurrection unto eternal life. Do you believe it? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So that's the question. Jesus asked, do you believe in him? Believing in him that he is the one that would provide salvation. And wonderfully, Martha said, yes, yeah, she believed in him for salvation. Now, how about the when Jesus uh, was on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection? Let's look at Luke 24, 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the Paul only is tell us that the information we need for salvation can only be found in Paul's letters. We can only be saved through the Apostle Paul. He's the only one that has the, this new revelation that is unique. And but Paul didn't say that. He said everything that he was saying was right in the, the Old Testament. As I discussed earlier, Paul would continue to go to every city, to the synagogue, and open up the scriptures and say, see this, see this, see this, see this, all these things written by the prophets that the, the, the Messiah must suffer and die and raise again. Well, it's all in the scriptures. So Jesus on the road to Emmaus is telling these people uh, that you can find this. He says, then he said to them, oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He's talking about the prophets that have written the scriptures that we call the Old Testament. And he says, it says in those scriptures, the prophet said, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? So the idea that Christ would suffer and die and, and to enter into his glory. So he says, that's, that's the prophets have written about that. And then he goes on to say, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Paul and Jesus they both taught easy believism. They both taught the purpose of the law was to show us the impossibility of following the law to be a schoolmaster so we'd understand that we can't do it. We need someone to save us and that Jesus is the Savior. And Paul and Jesus both continually went to the scriptures. Paul did it every time he entered a city. Jesus does it right here on the road to Emmaus. He goes through all the Old Testament prophecies 
and it shows them these are all the things that were told about what was going to happen that the messiah would come he'd suffer he'd die he'd be resurrected it's written about me so the information we need to understand for salvation that paul preached was not unique to paul it's throughout the whole bible let's go on now let's next well i think what i'll do is i'll stop here and next time i'll pick up with uh let's look at the book of john we'll see what john taught we'll see what other books say uh and uh yeah there's still there's still enough to be covered next time so i'll do one more teaching on this the conclusion next time but for now if you ha i, I want to leave you with this thought if, if, if you did not see part one and two i hope you will go watch this from the beginning it's very very important to understand and i, I was talking about this earlier i don't know if i really finished my thought on it. But uh, one of the brothers told me that he was tempted to go into this Paulonianism because it offered an easy solution to problem texts. But what is a problem text? Well, we, we have these two terms, problem text and proof text. I can give you dozens of texts, verses in the Bible that clearly state Jesus is eternal God Almighty. And then someone else can give me a text that is a problem because it seems to say something different. So we have to find a, a solution to that problem. How do we understand that? When this verse clearly says Jesus is God, and then this verse seems to question it, how do you resolve it, the problem text? The same kind of thing exists with faith alone. I can give you dozens of verses that are clearly stating that Faith is the only requirement. I mentioned some of them in this study. And then someone else can give me a verse and say, well, Brother Luke, what about this verse? What about that verse? These are problem texts that require an explanation. And I think I have a good explanation for the problem texts. But it's taken many years of study to understand the problem texts, how they fit in context. Uh, because most of the time, if you read the whole chapter around the problem text, you can see that it's not a problem at all. And even if the problem text does remain a problem, uh, it's, it's uh, debated. Most problem texts, uh, you, if you look at all the commentators, all the different viewpoints, there's like maybe five or ten different ways of explaining it. There's no common agreement about what it means. Well, I've said before that one of the basic principles of Bible study and, and forming your doctrines is you do not form your doctrines based on problem texts because they're too much too debated. They're too unclear. Uh, you form your doctrines and put your faith in the clear, simple verses like the verses I've given you today. So uh, it takes a lot of work to study like that. But... This, the tempting thing with Paul onlyism is that they can simply say, uh, well, uh, that verse in Matthew, forget about that. Uh, we don't even need to answer that. That doesn't apply to the church. That applies to the Jews. That's a different, a different gospel, a different, uh, totally different. You don't need, it's not for, it's not uh, to us for our salvation. We can, it's for us. They say it's not to us, but it's for us. It's for our learning. In other words, all scripture is profitable. We can learn from all scriptures, but it's not written to us for our salvation. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Old Testament, James, all these things, just you can just ignore those. Now, isn't that handy? Isn't that a wonderful, simple way of, of solving all the problem texts? Then all we're left is Rome with is Romans through Philemon and there's only a couple of problem texts in Paul's writings so uh, it sure makes it easy and uh, uh, someone else that, that I know I mean one of the another way of solving a problem is saying not only saying it, it doesn't apply to us it's just to apply to the Jews it's a different gospel but another way I've seen is well 
let's just tear that book out of the Bible and say it shouldn't even be there in the canon. Uh, th those are simple ways of solving problems, the problem text. It's a lazy way, but it's tempting. But I think if you really understand the principles I'm, I'm showing you today, first, we put our faith in the clear, simple verses. On all the problem texts, you study in context. And what you can see in context here is that the words of Jesus that are people say are problems. Well, if you understand that Jesus is using these verses not to tell you you've got to sell everything you own to get saved, but to, to convict you and say, this is impossible. I can't do it. Do it, Jesus. He say, that's why I'm here. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And it's the same thing that Paul was saying. The law was there just to convict you, to show you the impossibility of personal merit for salvation. So uh, that's one of the tempting things and tantalizing things about Paul onlyism is that you just you don't have to answer the problem text. You can just say, don't worry about that. It was not intended for the church, but it is. Uh, and and there, the, it, it's don't be lazy, study, and, and, and get learn the answers for the problem text. Uh, I find that there's really good answers for almost all the problem texts, but there still remain some texts that I, I I don't claim to understand everything, every verse in the Bible. If you if you understand every verse in the Bible, let me contact me because I've got a lot of questions for you. You can you can explain some of the verses I don't understand because there's plenty of verses in the Bible that I don't understand. And uh, I don't think anybody really understands them. Really, uh, they may grope for an answer. But if you claim that you understand every verse, I think that's the epitome of arrogance and, and boasting. So uh, the point I'm making here is that uh, we see that Paul and Jesus did not teach different message. They both taught faith alone for salvation. They both taught the purpose of the law was show you it's impossible and you need to cry out to God, God, I can't do it, save me. And, and we know that the only savior is Jesus. All right, so that'll conclude this study and I'll, I'll pick this up next time and we'll discuss the teachings uh, in other books. Uh, do they also agree or disagree with Paul. So um, thank you for watching and bless you in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.